Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we have the following announcements. Plastic Easter eggs and individually wrapped candy are being collected for the children's Easter egg hunt on April 8th. There will be baskets at both sanctuary entrances and a tub in the kitchen area. Uh, Easter lilies, it's time to order Easter lilies. Order forms at both sanctuary entrances. We need the orders turned in to the office by March 30th. Uh, do not forget, it will be time to spring ahead March 12th next Sunday, daylight savings time. Don't forget to turn the box forward. Uh, and then March 8th, 6 p.m., we'll have a Bible study in Heritage Hall. March 19th, we are called to respond with extravagant grace to the Uncor offering. There are printed cards um, for Uncor at both the sanctuary entrances. Upper room devotionals are available. Uh, those are also at both sanctuary entrances. Please pick up your copy. And don't forget to fill out your attendance pad at the end of your pew to let us know that you were with us in service today. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. It is a joy to worship with all of you this morning. Whether this is your first time or you have been attending for years, whether you are strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability, or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. What is it like to begin again? It is like flowers in the spring that push through the rosy ground. It is like babies learning to walk one clumsy step at a time. It is like Nicodemus in the night and asking Jesus for guidance. It is like a Sunday morning starting our week in the May we find God in our seeking. May we learn as we go. May we be brave enough to begin again. Let us worship the God in the beginning. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we sing together hymn number 369, Blessed Assurance.
believe in a God who meets us in the shadows, who welcomes our questions, who invites us to begin again. We believe that Jesus showed us a new way, a deeper faith, a more compassionate existence. We believe that all our beginnings should return us to this foundation, and that no matter how many times we lose our way, God always welcomes us home. Amen. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from the Lord. You may remain seated as we sing together hymn number 292, What Wondrous Love Is This?
stand as you are able for a reading from the Gospel of St. John. St. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The words of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. How do we begin again by Reverend Sarah A. C. Do we slide into something new? Do we make a formal announcement? Dearest reader, I have decided to begin again. Do we turn gradually, a gentle yield, in a new direction? Or like a wave, do we crash onto the shore of a new day? Do we grieve the change? Are there breadcrumbs on the path? Will Nicodemus be there? Will it ever be easy? I'm not sure exactly how we begin again, but I know that moths wrap themselves in silk, and after quite some time, after many long nights, after days spent alone, they break out of their shell. They pull themselves out under open sky, and they spend the rest of their days chasing the light. Maybe it's always that way with beginnings. Maybe it feels like a protective layer falling away. Maybe we have to go it alone at first. Maybe it feels like pulling and dragging yourself into something new. Maybe there's always a open sky at the other end. Amen. As we continue our journey through Lent, we are reminded of the ways in which we are seeking Christ throughout this season. We continue to seek answers about our faith and who Christ is in our lives. This morning, we are asking the question, how do we begin I am really glad that the lectionary this morning uses this interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus. Because I love this interaction. I love the way it is set up in verse 2. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night because of his position as a leader in the Jewish community. It was almost necessary for him to go in the dark to avoid persecution and questions that could come if he was seen consulting Jesus. 
but he had questions and wanted to ask those questions so that he might have a deeper understanding of what was going on. And while I don't necessarily think this is exactly how the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus would have gone, the setup makes me think about my college roommate and how we would have pillow talk every night as we were going to bed. We would talk about school and relationships, things we were struggling with, and everything in between. We would try to work out the problems we were having. We would try to better understand what was going on in our lives and the world. And here Nicodemus comes to Jesus because he wants to have a deeper understanding <coughs> about what it means to be born again in the Spirit. However, Nicodemus struggles to understand what Jesus is telling him. He struggles to see past the literal idea of being born again. Nicodemus is attempting a literal understanding of what Jesus says, but Jesus is using symbolic, spiritual language. According to the Gospel of John, seeking out Jesus is one of the first steps of discipleship. And during Lent, is that not what we are trying to do? Continuing to take steps toward discipleship. Our steps look different. Maybe we are just figuring out how to take the first steps into discipleship after simply going through the motions for a while. Or maybe we are taking a second or third step in the deeper discipleship. Or maybe we're backtracking on the steps we've taken so that we might begin our path again in a new way. Each of us is responding to this task in different ways because we each experience the world in different and unique ways just as Nicodemus and so Nicodemus can only respond to Jesus through what he knows to be true of the world. And this is what we do today. We try to understand God through our own personal experiences. We even affirm in the Wesleyan quadrilateral, which uses scripture, tradition, reason, and experience to understand who God is. But what is true of God is not always true of the world. With scripture as the primary and most important source for the revelation of God, with tradition, reason, and experience impacting our own personal understandings of the word of God, we are able to find some sort of answer, no matter how murky it may feel. And we see the truth of the world around us in tangible ways that we can hold on to. We see the truth of the world around us in our experiences with the world, with friends and family, with strangers. I struggled in college. One of those struggles, which if you want confirmation, my mom could after the service was chemistry. Now, keep in mind, I was in the easiest chemistry class I could take because I had dropped the harder one and changed my major. But I struggled with chemistry because I couldn't see what was happening. It's all on such an extremely micro level that I have a hard time connecting and understanding what is going on. One particular thing I struggled with was atoms. Now I can understand the nucleus of the atoms with the balance of the protons and neutrons at the center, with the center.
same number of each, and that the number of neutrons, uh, or the number of the number on the periodic table represents the number of protons in the atom. But then you get to the electrons, and we know how many there are, but we never really know where they are. They are constantly moving, constantly changing where they are in relation to the nucleus and other electrons. We can only predict how many electrons should be in the atom. And I will not get into anything deeper about atoms and electrons than that. Verse 8 says, the wind or spirit blows where it chooses. And you hear the sound of it, but you got, do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We don't know where the Holy Spirit is going, because the Spirit goes where it wants to. We don't know where it comes from or where it is going, but we do know that it is always moving and always present in our lives. And we can detect that presence in moments, in glimpses. We can feel God's presence with us through the movement of the Holy Spirit. And so as the Holy Spirit moves, we are also moved. And as we move through this season of Lent, we are continuing to seek where the Holy Spirit is moving in our lives. As we take time to recognize and reflect on the sacrifice that Christ made for each and every one of us. We believe as United Methodists that God is constantly working in every single person's life through provenient grace. It is available to all before we even know or believe in God, God is working in us. But God requires something of us. God requires a response to God's grace. And God's presence with us through the Holy Spirit enables and empowers the response of the believers. There is an ongoing rhythm between God and God's people because, to quote John Wesley, the life of God is in the soul of the believer. God breathes, and the soul breathes back. Through this invitation and through the deep relational connections with Christ, we are about to bear witness to the places in which God is working through our personal lives, in our communal relationships, and how we live in the world. We are able to see how we are experiencing the eternal life given to us through Jesus Christ. We have witnessed as this congregation has stepped into the gap to help provide food for students at Burke and St. B. Elementary Schools and for our community through Anne's Closet. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. I'm not great at memorizing Bible verses, but this one is ingrained in me, as I am sure it is ingrained in many of you. It is even ingrained in my largely non-religious brother who recited it with me without hesitation as we were talking this week. From the beginning, God has desired a personal relationship with all of God's creation even when we struggle to return the trust and faith. Even when we have not loved God with our whole hearts, even when we have not done God's will, even when we have broken God's law and rebelled against God's love, 
Yet, God sent God's only Son to save each of us in the personal ways in which we need to be saved. God's Holy Spirit moves in each of us, calling us to something greater than we can even imagine. God is calling us into eternal life here and now. God is calling us into eternal life in this immediate, not in an arbitrary time, sometime in the future. Friends, God is calling us into eternal life because the kingdom of God is among us in this very moment. And as the kingdom of God present with us and through Christ, we are invited to continue to take steps into deeper discipleship during this Lenten season. And we do not have to fear judgment or messing up because we are called by God and God moves in our lives. Our response is always enough. And when we are in relationship with the loving, non-condemning God as described by Jesus in John, then we become with each other people who can create hope liberate one another from injustice, and heal with each other for self-acceptance and right relationship with God and one another. God frees us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are free from the power of sin and death because God sent God's only Son. We are free from the power of sin and death because the Holy Spirit continues to move and work in our lives. We are freed from the, whole, from the power of sin and death because verse 17 says, Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Thanks be to God. At this time, I invite our ushers forward for this morning's offering. Let us pray. Oh God, pour out your spirit upon these our gifts that they might be used to show your love in the world. And let us see that the kingdom is here and now. In Jesus' name we pray.
come to our time of prayer this morning, we want to lift up all of those who are affected by the windstorm on Friday, those who have lost trees and power and injury. We want to lift up all of those who have been affected. We also give thanks for the tireless work that our electric companies have been doing to restore power to so many. We also want to lift up some members of clergy in this conference. Many, the Board of Ordained Ministry is meeting this week to interview candidates for commissioning and ordination. If you remember this time last year, that is what I was getting ready to go and do. And so we want to pray for all of the candidates who are journeying to Cedar Crest today. We also pray for the members of the Board of Ordained Ministry as they are in conversation and discussion about who will be ordained this year. Are there other joys and concerns this morning? Seeing that, let us go to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, God who sent your only Son to be with us, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the sunshine and the warmer weather. We give you thanks for safety and shelter. We give you thanks for another opportunity to gather together to worship your holy name. Oh God, as we come before you, we place all that is on our hearts at your feet. We place our prayers in the midst of hardship and struggle and stress and illness and grief. We place our joys, our hopes, our excitement God, we pray that you might continue to make your presence known among us. That you will empower us to continue seeking your will. That you will invite us to ask our questions and seek answers from you. God, we know that you are present among us, that your Holy Spirit is moving through us, and that we have been claimed by you through the power of our baptism, through your Holy Spirit. As we come to our time of Holy Communion, 
I want to remind you that you are welcome at this table. This is not my table. This is not St. Bethlehem's table. This is not the United Methodist Church's table. This is God's table. Where all are welcome, no matter what. At the conclusion of the liturgy, you will be invited to come forward and kneel at the altar, and you will be served the bread and cup. We will have an usher directing you forward, and you are invited, and I will dismiss you with a blessing. Any money that is left on the altar rail goes to our Healthy Hands Fund, which goes to help our community and our neighbors in need. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good. News. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and on your holy mountain he heard your still, small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us for our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness, 
where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on the cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during 40 days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now, when, you, when you we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us into repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. For out your Holy Spirit, on, on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Because there is one loaf, we who are many partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is sharing in the blood of Christ. At this time, I invite those assisting.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the community, communion of the Holy Spirit. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have revealed yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we come to the close of our service, you are invited to stand as you're able as we sing together, Begin Again, which is found on the back of your insert. It is a familiar tune, though, that you will recognize, but we will have Margaret play it through once, and then we will come in and sing all three verses. You are invited to stand as your people. Thank you. 